Isaiah 66 says, Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. He says, where is the house that you build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? But to this man I will look. To the one that is broken and of a contrite spirit and that what? Trembles at my word. Isaiah 66. That trembled at my word. Many people don't tremble at the word of God. It can't convict you. You can't be moved to tears when God is correcting. Or maybe someone is saying something inspired by the Holy Spirit. And you know God is speaking to you. But you had in your heart. That trembled at my word. And such a man was David. That when he numbered Israel, the Bible says his heart smote him. You must be under the commandment of the Lord if you will carry the ark of God. If not, it is a joke. The mountains won't pass. You will speak to issues and circumstances and they will look at you back in the face. You talk to spirits, spirits talk back to you. Say, go. Say, who are you? Because you are not under the government of God. This is important. Now, help me tell your neighbor, are you under the authority of God's word? It's not it's a rhetorical question. You, you know if you are or not. <laughs> are you under the authority of God's word? That's the symbolism of the ark. The Lord said in John chapter 14, when Judas came to meet him, he says, how will you manifest yourself and who will you manifest yourself through? The Lord said, if you love me, you will keep my commandment. If a man loves me, he will keep my commandment and I will love him. And I and my father will come and make our what? Abode. What is a powerful statement? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. You will honor the word of God when it comes. And that's what the Lord said. That when that happens, he now said, and I will manifest myself to him and through him. Glory to God. This is the covenant that I will make with the children of Israel after those days. I will write my laws in their hearts. Hebrews chapter 8. I will write my laws in their hearts. That's the key. It's a key. How much are you under the authority of God's word? Can you tremble? Do you tremble at the word of God? Do you treat the word of God with levity? Let us look quickly, just write... There are three signs or three things that show that the table of stones is absent in your ark. The first thing is that your heart, a heart that takes the matter of sin with levity. It's a joke. Say, oh, I will repent tomorrow. <laughs> and then make those pseudo confessions. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. If you are actively living in sin, deliberately and willfully, and say, okay, tomorrow I will repent. You are not the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, yes. Because he that is born of God will not willfully sin. I'm not talking about a struggle. If it is something that is intentional, you are not. The second thing that shows that the, the, the table of stones is absent in your ark is an unsubmissive heart. Towards God and towards God's people. Please, this is important. Right. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. An unsubmissive heart towards God and towards God's people is a second sign. First Peter chapter 5, verse 5. Let's actually look at that one quickly. First Peter 5, 5. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 together. One to go. Likewise, ye younger unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject what? Be subject what? One to another. And what? Be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud and gave it grace to the humble. 
The second sign that the ark is, the table of stones is not present in your ark is an unsubmissive heart towards God first, resisting the Holy Ghost. When Stephen spoke against the Pharisees, he said, you uncircumcised feelings things and uncircumcised Pharisees. Have you? The Pharisees now. Yes. You do always resist the Holy Ghost. We must learn to submit one to another. Submission is not only a concept in marriage. We must learn to submit one to another. It's a sign of the evidence of God's spirit in the life of the believer. Submission one to another. You must not always have your way. I want to do it this way. And if I don't do it this way, say the brethren, they've lost. You know, people do all manner of funny things. You must have your way. You must have your way. You believe it. This is what the Lord is saying. And this is, Lord, you want, this is what God is saying to me. Therefore, no other person can question me. Or let us do it this way, Brother Philip. You know? Or what do you think about doing it this way? I don't want to use you as an example. <laughs> Sorry, you were right in front of me. But no, not you, not you. Brother A, let us do it this way. And say, oh, no, 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 no. I believe it is this way. Say, no. I, and then there's contention. That's a sign of unsubmission. Un, an unsubmissive spirit. The Bible says here yeah, we should be clothed with humility. That means you must not always have your way. Even if you feel like you are correct, eventually the spirit of the Lord will make things clear. So, submission is a sign as the Lord in Philippians chapter 2. He says, who taught it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and being found in the fashion of a man. He humbled himself unto death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. So, submission, submitting one to another. Say, oh, this is your perspective, brother, but what do you think about this? Say, no, okay, no problem. Let's pray about it and let's look into it. It says, be clothed with humility. Glory to God. The third thing, because of time, that showed that the ark is not, the table of stones is not present in your ark, is an unforgiving spirit. An unforgiving spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 31. An unforgiving spirit. I will just read Ephesians 4, 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be what? Put away from you with all the next verse. See what it says. Let's read it together. I want to go. And be ye kind one to another. Tender hearted. Some people are stone, stone hearted. I will not forgive this person. Never. This thing that they did know. <laughs> Never. And you put yourself inside the cage. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another. What did he say? Even as God for Christ's sake had forgiven you. You know one thing the Lord made me understand? There's one sin that is actually more dangerous than immorality. It's actually unforgiveness. Unforgiveness is more destructive than lust. You know why? When you are still harboring unforgiveness, the Lord said to me, you are still in your sins. Because it is a divine injunction to forgive, a command. It says, forgive us our trespasses. As what? So let's twist it. If you don't forgive those who trespass against you, then the Lord will not what? That's why unforgiveness is the biggest open door to devils. Because you have just declared by that statement that Lord, because I won't forgive this person, therefore the Lord will say, okay, no worry, I step aside. I will not forgive you. And that's why Paul said, Alexander the copper, this man, he has done wickedly to me. Wicked. He betrayed me. He deserted me. Paul counted his betrayers. <laughs> and then he said, but I will forgive him, for we are not ignorant of the devices of the devil. That was where he made that statement. Because he knew 
with all the wickedness Alexander the Copper did to him, if he had held it in his heart, <laughs> all the spirits he cast out in Ephesus, all the juju men he destroyed in Corinth, <laughs> so he had no choice but to forgive. Somebody say, I will forgive. Let go of every pain, malice, lust, um, uh, bitterness, and throw them away. In 2024, we must turn a new leaf. In the name of Jesus. And if you have been struggling with unforgiveness, receive grace to let go. In the name of Jesus. Because we must carry the ark of God's presence in this coming year. Shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. The third thing, the golden pot that the golden pots of manna. Can we open the picture again? We are almost wrapping up soon. At least I think I'm trying with time today. The picture. If you are with me, I want us to echo it. What does Aaron's rod that body represent? Covenant prayer, yes. Okay, wait, wait, okay. Let me give it to someone. A covenant prayer life intermingled with the word of God. commandments. That's the representation of the word of God in heart. Thank you. Amen. Doing it like this, so just through some people will see whether you are listening. And if okay, please help us again. Thank you. Bringing yourself under the rule of the commandments of God. Bringing yourself under the rule and the commandment of God. That is you tremble at the word of God. You are under the authority of the word of God. That's powerful. I think that's one of the strongest. That's where the principle of consecration comes in. You can't be for Jesus and be living anyhow. And speak to situations and the parts. It's a lie. So that's important. Now, the third one. The golden pot that had manna. This thing looks like grounded rice or beans. I don't know what kind of picture. <laughs> it's the only one I could find, uh, find online. It looks like beans, grounded beans. But <laughs> that's not the way it looked like. Or they didn't. <laughs> but the golden pot that had manna, listen, it's also the word, right? But it is the word hidden in the heart of the believer. And I will explain this. When we talk about the golden pot that had manna, somewhere in the book of Revelation, it also describes it as the hidden manna that is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. Just quickly. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. There is a bit of a difference. The word of God may be able to convict you. The word of God, you may have respect and regard for it. But for the word to enter deep into you is a different ballgame. Revelation chapter 2 from verse 17. Let's, is it 17 now? Which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Yes, verse 17. Let's read it together. Just verse 17. Let's read it together. I want to go. He that had an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the what? He called it hidden, 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 hidden. The manner that is hidden. 
Let's turn to Psalm 119 again and look at from verse 9. We will read together. And this time we will rise to our feet and read it. Just to shake ourselves. Psalm 119. I like this. From verse 8 actually to verse 11. Let's rise to our feet as we read this. We we'll have one more point after this. The manna, the hidden manna in the ark. Psalm 119 from verse 8 to 11. Let's read it together. One, two, go. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Verse 9. Wherewith thou shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereunto according to thy word. This, this statement is one of the most powerful verse that can liberate a young person from lust. And it was one of my, the, in this context, scriptures that held clo close to my heart. And that's why I regard the word of God. It says, is it possible for a young man to cleanse his way? Thy word have I hidden in my heart. That word, I might not sin against thee. Let's shout amen. amen. You can sit down. Thy word. So it is not just the word, but it is the word that has entered. The word that is hidden. That's why it's called the hidden manna. The word that has seeped deep. For it is the one that has entered deep that in the face of a temptation, that one that has entered deep is what will cause you to say no. He says, thy word have I hidden in my heart and the ripple effect is that I may not sin against thee. I love it. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way but by taking heed thereunto according to thy word with my whole heart I have sought thee. Keep your gaze on the word of God. Stay with the word of God. And so I will just make this point. The difference between the table of stones and the hidden manna. The hidden manna comes in through meditation. Somebody say with me, meditation. Meditation. Say it. Do you know meditation is an art that I don't think we fully understood it yet. You see, by meditation, spiritualists travel into realms. You say, gay, keep your gaze quiet. People who got uh, opened themselves to Eastern um, religion and uh, all those yoga. Hope nobody does yoga here. If you do yoga, come for prayers. <laughs> ah, <yeah. laughs> Clear your mind and think about the skies. Om. <laughs> That's what they do. Clear your mind and then spirits enter as you open the door. <laughs> <laughs> meditate on the cloud that's what they do I'm telling you monks you think they clear it just imagine yourself like a bird flying <sighs> and they meditate and while they are doing that they've cleared their mind and truly it's, it's an effect that can calm the soul but when the soul is in that state oh all kinds of things begin to enter now, meditation is a practice that has been stolen from scriptures. The word meditate was used, I'm sure, more than a hundred times in the Psalms. And if the word will be hidden in your heart, then you must take it. You must practice the art of meditation. For it is by meditation that it goes from head knowledge to heart knowledge. It's not the word that is in your mind that will cause you not to sin against God. But it is the word that is hidden in your heart. Look at the psalmist. He says, I have sought thee with all my heart. Let me not wander from your word, O God. He says, how, Psalm 119 verse 97 says, Oh, how I love thy law. They are my meditation all the day. He knew that the secret was the word. May the Lord give you an appetite for his word. In the name of Jesus. So to meditate, if it will go deep and enter, seep deep, then we must meditate. And I want to just explain very quickly what meditation is. Meditation is a very interesting practice. Actually, 
the word, I said this again and again, is a word in the Hebrew, Hebrew word that is Hagar. Very interesting. And Bible study. Before you go to bed, no. Day and what? So that means that man, the word of God is always in his mouth. He's always speaking it. He's always muttering it. Brethren, that is the way the word will go from your head to your heart. Another meaning of the word is to muse. Deep thoughts. David said, while I mused, the fire began to burn. This is very important. How much, what do you say? What are the things that you are saying on a day-to-day -day basis? What is coming out from your mouth? Sometimes they will think you are doing it too much or you are overdoing. That's the power of purity. The power that can subdue the soul is in the word of God. And the word that is hidden, it's hidden and enters by meditation. Speak to mutter and to muse. Before Isaac, most of them did it. Before Isaac would see Rebekah, the Bible said that he was meditating in the evening tide. So he took the law and was just muttering it and re rehearsing the things that his fathers had spoken to him. They would take them and meditate. It was a practice. What about Joshua? He said, this book of the law shall not depart out of where, but thou shalt meditate on it day. The prescription is day and night. Don't let nonsense fill your mind. Don't give your thoughts to vanity and nonsense and trash. Scripture says, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue or any law. What did he say? The part that hits me the most is, whatsoever things are of good report. Hey! Talk back. You hear what thing happen. <laughs> person don't mess up. Oh. This person die. Something happen. All those negative, useless reports. You, somebody may tell me the report, but I won't think about it. Tell your neighbor, don't think on negative reports. But think on the word of God. Hallelujah. Say it to him again. Don't think of negative reports. Tell him, don't meditate on negative reports. But think on the word of God. Brethren, when you are at work, what do you think of? What are you thinking of? When you are in school, when you are in your class, what, 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 what passes through your mind? Eh? What, like, literally, what goes through your mind on a normal day? And I've used this to assess myself. Ha! Huh? Is most of the time when you are deep in those thoughts that something, an inspiration, the Spirit of God just breathes and He's speaking to you and ministering to you. Don't think of nonsense. And, but the Bible says, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Glory to God. Shout amen. Shout amen again. Amen. These three things, when they are present in your ark, oh, when you come before circumstances, spirits, deities like Dagon, when you come before situations and you speak the word, when you release a blessing and say, be blessed, a covenant prayer life intermingled with the word, you can't separate it from fasting. Prayers and fasting will always multiply prayer power. Like a man, God on Lindsay, we say, prayer, fasting multiplies prayer power a thousand times more. A covenant, a commitment to the place of prayer as Aaron's rod that bodied. The second one, a life that is ruled by the word of God. The principle of consecration. That Lord, it says, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. A life that is ruled by the word. And then number three, the hidden manner. The word that is hidden. And that happens and takes place as you meditate on the word of God and make it a practice. Speak it. Mutter it. 
muse over it. Think about it. Enrapture your mind with the word of God. When these things are present in your ark, you will see the power of God moving through you. The ark did not need to do much. Once you just entered into the place, things started to happen. You can't have a fireful prayer life and the realm of the Spirit does not recognize you. It's impossible. If you were really given, many times you will see in the Old Testament, it says, and they went up to pay their vows to the God of Israel. And they went to pay their vows. Now, if you break your vows, God is also a good father. That's the balance now. He will not accuse you. He will not condemn you. But as much as the Holy Spirit empowers you, keep your covenant. Keep your vows. And he honors it. He knows when you are drowsy or you are tired and you are struggling in the place of prayer. He knows. He said, Lord, remember David and all his afflictions and all his sacrifices. How he vowed a vow unto the God of Jacob, saying, Surely I will not go up to my bedchamber, neither will I give sleep to my eyes until I make a tabernacle for the God. Of Jacob. So he says, remember me and the sacrifices. Remember my covenants. Remember when I wanted to sleep and the sleep was so sweet. But I said, no, I will pray today. Remember when I was struggling, speaking in tongues and I was trying to pray. I slept. I woke up. Remember. Remember David and all his afflictions. God honors vows and covenants. Glory to God. Covenant keeping God, there is no one like you. Alpha and Omega, we say there is no one like Covenant keeping God, Covenant keeping God, there is no one like you. Alpha and Omega, we say there is no one like you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The fourth point, written on your outline there, number four, is not a fourth instrument. There were only three, but it's a fourth requirement that must be present in the life of one that will host the divine presence. Mind you, this subject is not only speaking in an individual context. Also, as a church, as a body, God views the ark as his body, the view of his perfected church. And these things must be present. A church that keeps covenant, a church full of the word, a church under the authority of God's word, and a church given to the meditation of his word. Now, the fourth thing there. Once you have your outline, I actually wrote number four, but I didn't put anything there intentionally because it's not a, an instrument, but a very critical requirement. Number four. Number four is a life of deep-hearted praise and worship. Say with me, a life of deep-hearted praise and worship. The Bible says, thou that inhabitest the praise of his people. That word, yashab. Yashab. Say with me, yashab. Say it again, yashab. <laughs> not lishab. Yashab. Mm -hmm. No, Daniel, not yashab. Yashab. Say it, yashab. Mm -hmm. That's the way, I'm a bit of a Hebrew, so you have to pronounce it properly. All right. The word yashab means he's sitting in the midst of his people. Another one is that meaning is that he's exalted in the midst of his praises of his people. You check the word. That means God manifests himself in a unique way in an atmosphere of praise. That's why in the Ark of the Covenant they had to sing around it. They danced around it. They worshipped around it. We are going to see some of the Psalms and then we'll pray. This is the, we're wrapping it up now. Powerful praises and worship that went on on the ark with instruments, instruments of ten strings, with pipes, and then they were dancing in the ark and then 
the God of Israel always manifested himself. Let us see. We saw last time how David danced around the ark. But we will take it more deliberately. Now, 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Let's turn in our Bibles. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. Mm-hmm. Hallelujah. 1 Chronicles chapter 15. We're going to read a few. Just start with 26 and 28. All right. So this is after they brought it out of the house of Obededom. The Bible gives details of what happened. It was not just that David danced. But they were offering sacrifices. All right. Let's look at 26. From verse 26. Are we there? Just read. 26 to 29. One to go. And it came to pass, when God helped the Levites that bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, that they offered seven bullocks and seven rams. And David was clothed with a robe of fine linen. And all the Levites that bear the ark. And what? The singers. And the Cheniahs, the master of the song with the singers, David also had upon him the ephod linen. The best worshippers, he called them to come and start singing. The next verse, 28. Thus, all Israel brought up the ark of the covenant of the Lord with what? Shouting and with the sound of the cornet and with what? Trumpet and with what? Cymbals and what? Making noise with psalteries and harp. It was a glorious experience. When you see the atmosphere of praise, they were shouting, Praise be to the God of Israel. And from afar, you will hear the noise, bam, 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 the blast of rams, the blast of trumpets. The best singers in Israel were around the ark and they were singing and singing and dancing to the God of Israel in the midst of the ark. And David brought his effort. Now, the next chapter is a continuation. Going there, we are going to read the whole of First Chronicles 16 from verse 4. Let's rise to our feet now. Let us see what happened here. From verse 4 to 37. First Chron- Chronicles 16 from verse 4. To 37. Look at the psalms and the praises that were offered in the Ark of the Covenant. Are we ready? This is a psalm of praise. We are going to be wrapping up now. We are going to echo this. So let us see what happened from verse 4. One to go, and he appointed certain of the Levites to minister before the Ark and to record and to thank and to praise the Lord God of Israel. Asaph, the chief, and next to him, Zechariah, Jael, and Shimaramoth, and Jehiel, and Matiah, and Eliab, and Beniah, and Obededom. Obededom joined the worship team. And Jael with psalteries and with harps, but Asaph made the sound with cymbals. Benaniah also, and Jahazel, the priest, with trumpets continually before the ark of the covenant of God. 24-7 praise and worship. Verse 7. Then on that day, David delivered first this psalm to thank the Lord, the hand of Asaph and his brethren. Now this is a psalm. This psalm came when by inspiration when David was looking at the ark. Glory to God. Glory to God. As you behold the ark, divine inspirations to worship him comes hallelujah for god knows the way he wants to be worshiped and so he gives you the word in order to offer the right worship to him as you behold the ark he gives you what to say back to him hallelujah verse seven let's read then on sorry verse eight the psalms give thanks unto the lord let's read Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him. Sing psalms unto him. Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Seek the Lord and his strength. 
Seek his face continually. Remember his marvelous works that he had done, his wonders and his judgment of his mouth. O ye seed of Israel, his servant, ye children of Jacob, his chosen ones, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. Be ye mindful always of his covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even the covenant which he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac, and had confirmed the same to Jacob for a law and to Israel for an everlasting covenant, saying, Unto thee will I give the land of Canaan, the lot of your inheritance. When ye were but few, even a few, and strangers in it, and when they went from nation to nation and from kingdom to another people, he suffered no man to do them wrong. Yea, he reproved kings for their sake, saying, Touch not mine anointed, and do my prophets no harm. Sing unto the Lord all the earth, show forth from day to day his salvation. Declare his glory among the hidden, his marvelous works among all nations. For great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. He is also to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the people are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. Give unto the Lord, ye kindreds of the people. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him all the earth. The world also shall be stable that it will not be moved. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. And let them say among the nations, The Lord reigneth. Let the sea roar and the fullness thereof. Let the fields rejoice and all that is therein. Then shall the trees of the wood sing out at the presence of the Lord, because he cometh to judge the earth. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And say ye, save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together, and deliver us from the hidden, that we may give thanks to the holy name, and glory in thy praise. Blessed be God of Israel forever and ever. And the people said, Amen, and praise the Lord. Let's shout a sevenfold Amen. 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 When we when we shout like this, sometimes people think it's a joke. When they shout a sevenfold, they say, Amen. They did it in front of the God of Israel, and the Lord received it. He yashabed the praises. Glory to God. We're going to take one more psalm in praises. Thereafter, we'll burst out to praise and worship to God. And then I take a line of ministry, and we leave. Psalms 148. Psalm 148. Psalm 148. We're reading all the way to 150. Brethren, I want you to see the ark of God before you. As you lift up this praise before the Lord. See him before you. You are an ark of his presence. Psalm 148 from verse 1 to 150. Every word of these psalms carry power. These psalms of praise to Psalm 150. Psalm 148 all the way to Psalm 150. Psalm 148 from verse 1. One, two, go. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise him all his hosts. Praise him sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heaven. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He had also established them forever. He had made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deep, fire and hail, stormy vapor, stormy wind fulfilling his word, even mountains and all hills. Fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowls, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and children, Joel and maidens and old men. For his name alone is excellent. 
His glory is above the heaven. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, a people near unto him. Pray. Let's shout amen. amen. The next verse. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. For the Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with deliverance. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouths and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the hidden and punishment upon the people, to bind kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all saints. Praise ye. Let's shout amen. amen. 150. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery and harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with the stringed instruments and organs. Praise him upon the loud cymbals. Praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Shout a sevenfold amen. 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 Begin to praise the Lord. Worship Him. Worship Him. Worship Him. Worship Him. Worship Him. Sing praise to the God of Israel.